Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. Um, so let's talk briefly about the Hound and the Falcon trilogy and the fact that I'm not doing the last book in the trilogy. Um, I genuinely don't like the last book as much as I like the first two. It's fine in its way, uh, but I... And it may just be, you know, my personal unhappiness with bittersweet endings and things, but I I have a difficult time with the way that Gwydion's uh, son is killed so early on in the book, and it just, it, it, it's just ruinous, and I mean, there is basically a a boy killed at the start of Alamut, which is obviously the book that I'm going to be talking about. Um, but in its way, it, it it feels a little bit less immediate. You come to care about you come to care about Thibault very quickly, of course. Um, but it's not quite the same, and there is. And part of it, I think, is that Gwydion's grief is immediate and devastating in this book. They're in the third book. And it it really, really makes the rest of the book hard. It um, the, the twisting that happens later in the book that that happened to two people emotionally is is problematic. Uh, the fact that Alf is genuinely unbalanced throughout this book, that, you know, we've spent two books watching him claw his way from, you know, a monk who's basically locked himself into his monastery out of fear of what he is, and he's finally ventured out into the world and figured out who he is and become something, and then he goes a little crazy, and it's... Um, well, I suppose you could argue there are shades of Anakin Skywalker. Note that I have been reading way too much Star Wars fan fiction lately, so Anakin Skywalker is top of mind. I mean, you know, he doesn't go killing people, does Alf, but he is kind of unbalanced when he loses Taya and his twins. Um, and the thing that gets me most at the end of the book is the fact that the Rhiannon's leave the world, that the forest of Broceliand is effectively, it's one of those gateways between one world and another one, and the fey folk vanish under the, under the mound, or however you want to put it. And, and you have this final moment where Jean is, is saying, you know, Damn you, Alf, you've taken all the magic out of the world, and then, like, this cross is in his hand. All of the magic? And it's like, no, yes, yes, really. Taken all the magic out. Um, you know, everybody is scattered to the four winds, and, and, and it's over. And on the one hand, I get it, you're closing out the end of an era, and there will be no more witch folk, and so on and so forth. But... It's, I just find the ending of it all just that little bit unsatisfying, and so I'm not actually going to properly review it. I am going to waste four minutes complaining about it, as I have just done, but I'm not going to actually talk about it. We're going to move on to the other two books in this series, because there is, in fact, a duology connected to The Hound and the Falcon. And that is Alamut, this book, and its sequel, The Dagger and the Cross. In the series, Hound and the Falcon, um, which is briefly referenced in Alamut, actually, in a sort of a sideways way, um, you have the character of Gwydion, King Gwydion of Rhianna, um, and Gwydion appears in the first book, pretending to be nothing more than Alan, a knight messenger on behalf of King Gwydion, revealing himself to be the king at the end of the book. And he shows up in the third book briefly in the first couple chapters before Alf sets out to Rome with Anna and uh, 
and Nikiforos in tow. Um, but he's a tertiary character, and his twin brother Aiden is even more tertiary. However, Alamut is all about Prince Aiden. Uh, he occasionally references his brother, his twin brother Gwydion. Um, I mean, Aiden is a prince of Rihanna, and how do you not mention your king brother? Um, uh, and so the thing is that this book opens with Aiden arriving in the Holy Land, visiting family because he has a nephew um, who has gone to the Holy Land, has married, has, you know, set up shop there, and, and so on. And he, Aiden arrives there to find that his nephew has been killed by assassins. Um, and it's one of the things about a Judith Tarr novel is however much she deviates from the actual history of the period... When you read her endnotes, you can tell that she has genuinely done research into the period. You know, she will go through who the real people are and who the people she made up are and where she has deviated from what actually happened as opposed to, you know, what she wanted to happen. Because in some of her books, she has done a, here's what would have happened if King Richard had had, you know, magic people at his fingertips working for him and... Uh, has also done a certain amount of here's magic working in and around and backwards and between what really happened. Um, Alamut is very much one of those books that seems to fit in and around history. None of the major events or battles that you would expect to see um, occur in this except possibly the Princess Sibylla's marriage, uh, because, I mean, you know, there's a historical fact that she married, but it's an entirely background thing that's just sort of happening. But otherwise, none of... There are no events. This is just Aiden traveling from place to place and meeting real people who really existed. Um, and so he he finds out that assassins have murdered his nephew and he loved his nephew his nephew was just a joy to him and i want you to keep in mind that uh like alf in the uh in hound and the falcon like gwydion these are people who among their many superpowers is what they have believe is very likely some sort of immortality because, because right there and then, Aiden is 60, 70 years old. In Hound and the Falcon, when somebody asks Gwydion, well, how old are you, you beardless stripling? And Gwydion looks at them and says, 81. But they look like they're in their 20s, like they're in their late teens. That's the whole elven immortality thing is very much at play here. And so Aiden's nephew isn't a child. Aiden's nephew is is a man in his in his early thirties, uh, who has a wife and child of his own. Uh and Aiden arrives there to find that the wife uh you know, is mourning the death of her husband. And it turns out that the wife is the cause in, you know, that sort of backwards way of the assassination. That is, she is from a very, very, she is originally from a very wealthy uh, Muslim family, that her family, her extended family is Muslim. And they are an incredibly powerful merchant family, the kind of powerful merchants who have as much, if not more, power than actual royalty. And uh, and so part of this book is is Aiden venturing through this alien uh, this alien culture. Um, and as he 
because he arrives in that grand fire that a great many crusaders and other people have done in the past where they think of their god and their culture and their everything is so very, very superior, and he gets there and he discovers things like Turkish baths, and he's going, wow, this is, this is great. This is like hot water, and I feel super clean, and that is awesome, because he actually likes being clean. He's, you know, it's the medieval period. Not everybody's clean, but to discover this place where people, like, get really super clean is amazing. Um, and the swordsmithing, which is vastly different from what he's used to in the West and is an art and a skill that he is vastly impressed by. And so we follow that and we follow Morgiana, who is the slave of Alamut. She is an assassin. She is, in fact, the assassin that kills first Jorain, who is Aiden's nephew, but then also kills uh, Thibaut, who is Jorain's son. And Thibaut, Thibaut volunteered to go with Aiden. He said, you know, you're a prince. You need to have a retinue. You need to have, at the very least, a squire. And I need training. I, you know, how can I advance through knighthood if I don't have this apprenticeship? And Morgiana kills him. And... Aiden doesn't realize that she is the assassin. He is aware that another elf person like him is following him, but he has no idea that she's the assassin. And she has never seen anyone like her, you know, biologically speaking, another elf. In her case, uh, because of where she's from, he is Ifrit to her Ifrita, uh, you know, spirit of fire to her spirit of air, actually. I, I believe she's Afarit, and he's... I, I don't... I don't know enough Arabic to, you know, make any comments on the differences uh, of such things. But in any way, in any event, she's basically hypnotized by him. The intriguing centerpiece of this book, um, in the end is the part at the end where she kidnaps him and basically Stockholm syndromes him into falling in love with her. I, it's it's a little bit hinky, the part where she fall where, you know, she convinces him to fall in love with her. And I think we're supposed to lean very hard on, you know, the ultimate call of love at first sight and that sort of thing. There's a very, very strong romantic bent in Judith Tarr's novels, um, or at least all the ones I've read. Uh, and so it's, it is the one really awkward thing where she kidnaps him and she's like, you're just going to stay here until you fall in love with me. And finally she's like, okay, fine. I will help you get your revenge on the assassins because, you know, I am the slave of Alamut. I am bound. There is like a magic thing that is binding me. Uh, it later turns out that it's her own magic binding her because she convinced herself of stuff. But anyways, um, the point is that she thinks that she's bound. She thinks she can't get out of it. And it wasn't her that made the decision. It was Sinan, the old man of the mountain, who made the decision. Uh, and so she's like, okay, in exchange for helping me get free, I will help you get your revenge and, you know... Also, I expect you to sleep with me. So uh, he does, and he thinks that he has quote-unquote satisfied her, and then it turns out she shows up just when he's trying to swear fealty to the, to the king in Jerusalem, the man who, the very young man who is, you know, who is the, the king. And she's like, nope, nope, you can't, he can't swear anything to you because he's still encumbered, he owes me. And they wind up engaged by the end of the book. It's it's an intriguing and delightful romp, this book. Um, very, very East meets West. Uh, but I, I enjoy it. Uh, so I'll be 
next week covering the sequel to this in which we finally get more of Gwydion and Gwydion's actual perspective. So I will see you all next week. <laughs>